Lord, thank you for this. So, Lord, we welcome you here. We ask in the name of Jesus that in your presence, Lord, and the gathering of your people, Lord, as we sing songs of praise and worship to you, as we bring our offerings to you, Lord, as we hear the word of God, Lord, as we celebrate and worship, that we be changed in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Our call to worship is from Psalms chapter 47. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord the Most High is the honor, great King over all the earth. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. We will sing praises for the song. Let's worship the Lord. Amen. Okay, we're going to start out with, Here I Am to Worship. <clears throat>
So let's stand, please, and we're going to start with uh, How Majestic Is Your Name. <clears throat>
this morning. Romans 7, 1 through 14. Just a little inside joke, dated September 30th. <laughs> okay, uh, Romans 7, 1 through 14. Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to men who know the law, that the law has authority over a man only as long as he lives. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. So then, if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress, even though she marries another man. So, my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. For when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies, so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, Do not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. From apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life, and I died. So I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. But in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. Thank you, Stan. So, I went and sat down, and when I sat down, I saw a bunch of Christmas boxes there. So I was thinking maybe I should have made that announcement too. Sunday school will be collecting items for shoe boxes until November 11th, with a packing party on November 7th. Contact Valley if you'd like to donate items or help with the party or contribute money for shipping. Okay, so we are back to the book of Romans, our truths from Romans. And uh, thanks, Stan, for reading the first half of the, the book. And uh, in chapter 7, I want us to look here that uh, Paul talks about the law using marriage as an example. And he points out that when someone that even though when we're married, when the other person dies, we're free to marry again. You hear that, Dee? <laughs> As disciples of Jesus, we have died to the law. And in a sense, the law has died to us because it's been nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ. So we're no longer, this is what Paul's getting at, right? He's getting at the fact that we're no longer in covenant with the law. And so it's always interesting to me how people seem to migrate, want to go migrate back to the law and walk back to its commandments and back to its regulations. And uh, there's groups alive and well that are teaching people that they can be Christians, but they have to follow this law and that law of the Old Testament, the eating commandments or the... The, the, the feasts or the festivals, etc. And Paul said, listen, you have died and that spouse has died to you. That is the covenant, the Old Testament covenant that you had with the law. And you are now a disciple of Jesus Christ who's died to, to the, the law has died to us because of Jesus, been nailed to his cross, and we are now released from that so that we can serve Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. And so Paul starts out with, I think, a very significant idea. He says, we have a new marriage, and this new marriage, and it's a, the word marriage with Jesus. And that's what he's saying, is that you have a new marriage, you have a new relationship, you're married to Jesus Christ. And in verse 4, he says, so my brothers, you also died the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, that is Jesus Christ, right? To him who was raised from the dead. And then this is what I think is interesting. 
we belong to Jesus now. And you know, you look at just one sentence, Paul says, and it actually has a lot of power. And he says, you belong to Jesus Christ and you will bear fruit. That you will bear fruit. And it's interesting to me as we're going through Romans, right? We're talking about the law over and over again. The spirit of grace does what the law can never do. If you think about it, right? If you are a good follower of the law and you keep the commandment perfectly, the best you're going to say at the end of the day is, you know what I didn't do is I didn't murder anyone. Praise God. I'm a follower of the law. I didn't steal from anybody today. I didn't adulterer. I'm just a good guy. I'm a follower of the law. If you could be the perfect follower of the law, which no one could be, and do it all perfectly, the best you could say at the end of the day is that you didn't do what you weren't supposed to do. But the law of the Spirit is so much more than that, right? I not only, by, the, by when we're in Christ, we belong to Him and we bear good fruit in Him by the Spirit of grace, we can say, you know what? Didn't kill anybody. I brought words of life to them. Maybe, maybe even I got to be a part of them coming alive. I not only didn't kill anybody, but through the gospel of Christ and the spirit of Christ, I actually brought life. I didn't steal from anyone. Instead, I was willing to give or to sacrifice or to sow, make an investment in someone. And it's just amazing to me as we see this over and over again in the word of God, is the spirit of God does what the law could never do. It doesn't just keep us from not doing what we're not supposed to do. It makes us do the things that God wants to do. So the spirit of grace means that, means that the law of grace is not only a child who won't steal, but it be generous. It's, it, Paul points out that we're not under the law, but it's still beneficial to us. So we're not, we're not trying to disrespect the law because it's beneficial to us and to Christ's followers in general because it's through the law we're made aware of sin. He said, it, the, the law says, do not covet it, covet, but sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. I was reading a story about a hotel built in Galveston right over the, the ocean, and actually one part of the building actually hung out over the water on, on posts. And uh, before it opened, one of the managers was walking around, and he said to himself, you know what? People are going to be fishing out the windows. That's what they're going to do. They're going to be fishing out the window. So he, th he thought, you know, I'm going to nip this in the bud. He put signs up everywhere. He said, no fishing out the windows. Absolutely no fishing out the windows. And you know what happened when they opened, right? They were constantly plagued with people fishing out the windows, right? Because the very fact that he said, don't do it, makes people want to do it. I think I've told you this story about Russians. That it's their story, not Americans. That's why I like it. So it's from their perspective, and the, and the, the joke is, how do you get Fr a Frenchman to jump off a giant bridge that's over this body of water? And according to the Russian mentality, you tell that Frenchman that there's six semi-clad beautiful women in the water to jump right over. How do you get an American to jump into the water? And the Russian joke goes like this. You tell them there's six drowning children in the water, and they'll jump in. How do you tell a Russian? How do you get a Russian to jump in there? The answer is you put a big sign up that says absolutely no jumping from this bridge. <laughs> and uh, I remember myself, I think, you know what, I think we, I think we have, even as in Christ, I think we still have to fight that rebellious thing that wants to do what we're not supposed to do. But I remember when we lived at the children's home, we had, we had bars on the windows and alarms on the door, so as soon as we went in there for the evening, it was like you didn't leave that room. But one time the alarm didn't work on one of our doors. It was like a, a bedroom, a bathroom, and a bedroom. And then so we, everything was two bedroom units like that. And one of the doors, the alarm wasn't working on. So what do you do? Well, the answer is, of course, you sneak out at night. And we snuck out and, and uh, we went outside and down the road there was a guy growing a bunch of watermelons. And he had a big sign up that said, you know, basically something like no trespassing. So what did we do? We went in there and we smashed his watermelons, threw them into the street. All, not because we even wanted a watermelon, but just because we wanted to do what we weren't supposed to do. In Augustine, the, uh, one of the uh, early teachers in the church said that uh, he, he was in from in around the year 350, 
And uh, he said one time, there was a pear tree near his vineyard when he was a boy. And he said, he and some youths set out to rob it. And I thought, you know, it's interesting. It's 350. The youths weren't really that different from 1970. He said, we took off a, a huge load of pears, not to feast on ourselves, but to throw them to the pigs. We ate just enough to have the pleasure of eating forbidden fruit. And they were good pears. He said, but we had a pear tree in our own yard. I had plenty better at home. He said, I picked them simply to become a thief. The desire to steal was simply awakened by the prohibition of stealing. And that's what Paul is talking about here. He goes on in Romans chapter 14, and that's where we're going to pick up, and that's really what we're going to be talking about is the next verses here. Chapter 7, verse 14, he says, We know that the law is spiritual, but I'm unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do, not want. Wow, that's a tongue twister. The evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil's right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in, my, in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. The title of today's message is the Battling the Beast Within. And I want us to consider the struggle that Paul tells us is inevitable in our walk. And you know, we've gone down this Romans road, it's twisted as we've gone, beginning with the sin problem where Paul lays out the case that all people are sinful, all are worthy to die because of the just condemnation of a righteous and a holy God. He talked about the inability of the goodness of, of man to fix the sin problem, the inability of the law, and finally the sin solution God provided through Jesus Christ, his son. Then we talked about Saul, he took us down the road that talked about the benefits of the grace of God, the importance of not using grace as a liberty to sin. And it seems now, as we get into this verse here, it almost seems like Paul is, is going back and... and, and uh, and sort of hammering on us and reminding us of this sinful nature that we have. And it's almost as though he's talked about the grace of God. And now you could think that he could move to the next step and say, listen, here's the benefits of grace. Here's what God has done. Here's what Christ has done. Now, dot, 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 go and sin no more. Really, you can see where this is where that road might seem to look like it should go to. And instead, Paul takes a very different turn. And he points out that there's this battle going on inside of God's people, a beast within. In the, in the older versions of the Bible, it calls it our flesh. And some of the newer versions, it calls our fallen human nature, our old man. And this old man is in conflict with the new life and the nature that God has given us. Now, you know, I say this, and that's not a statement that a lot of, that everyone in the church agrees with. I don't mean our congregation. I mean the church in general. There's many ch people in the church who believe, and for a long time have believed this. They believe that Paul is not talking about Christians. They believe that Paul is talking about those who have yet to accept Christ. He th they think he's talking about those guys in chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3. And they think he's not talking about Christians when he depicts this battle of the beast. Because they have difficulty in accepting that Paul would be talking about himself as a believer or any Christian when he refers to himself as a prisoner of the law of sin. And they have a hard time believing that Paul could be saying that he is a wretched man or a slave of sin. 
And so their argument is that Paul is referring to the unregenerate, to the unsaved, and not the believer. But I think that it's clear from the Word of God that he may be referring in general to all people, but specifically, he is talking about us, and he's talking about himself. And uh, I think the people who struggle with this problem, I think they, they are struggling with those two apparently contradictory truths idea that we we're talking about that the book of Romans is filled with, right? So I think that Paul's talking about Christians in the battle of the fallen human nature because number one, it's a theme, it's a doctrine of Paul's in the New Testament. This is not the only place we're going to hear Paul talk about. I was thinking just one example would be Galatians chapter 5, so we're around verse 18 through 20, right, where Paul talks about the, uh, the, the fruit of the spirit and the fruit of the flesh, and he talks about how apparent uh, the fruit of the spirit is and how apparent the fruit of the flesh is. And he's talking to, to Christians, right? He says, the sinful nature desires what's contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what's contrary to the sinful nature. They're in conflict with each other. First John 1 John 1.8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So this theme about this battle of the beast inside is a doctrine of Paul's. It's a theme of the New Testament, and it's even in the Lord's Prayer. If you see the Lord's Prayer as a daily prayer, one of the things you're praying is, Father, forgive my sins as I forgive those who sin against me. Father, forgive my sins. Well, if we believe that other way, we believe that we're you know, not having to struggle with this beast within, we certainly wouldn't be having to run to the Lord every day praying for daily forgiveness of sins, would we? And uh, the New Testament commands us to crucify the flesh. That's another reason why I'm sure this is talking about a Christian's battle with this beast, is that we're to crucify the flesh. It would be wonderful if God would crucify our flesh. We could go, you know what, I got saved, hallelujah. Now God sanctified me, I'm holy, blameless, without reproach. Not just in a matter of theory, but actually, it's it, out there. I think I told you about a denomination I belong to, or actually worked with them. And uh, they, they were sanctifications and perfections. So that means they believe that the second work of the Holy Spirit can make you completely holy, that you can walk in this earth every day without any sin at all. And the interesting thing was it was a, it was a, a group of very nice pastors and very nice uh, congregations. And uh, I was in uh, Mississippi. We were doing some kind of uh, helping rebuild things down there and doing some outreach after that hurricane went through there. And uh, we were together with the, with the men, the pastors, and we were all in this big bunk room, you know, and there was maybe 20 of us in that room. And so I wanted to hear this experience that they were talking about that had made them holy. I was interested to see like what how they would how they would express how that happened. And so I asked them, we were sitting around in a big circle. I said, So, brothers, you know, I know that one of your denominational distinctives is that you believe in the second work of the Holy Spirit that can make you completely holy without any sin. And I said, just to be honest, I'm, I'm a little cynical of that, being that uh I haven't seen it really myself, and not really sure where God's Word teaches it, but you're my friends and my brothers, what, how, what is it like for you? And then one first guy said, well, I never actually experienced that second blessing, but I'm waiting for it. Second guy, well, I haven't either, but you know, I'm thinking that it's going to come one of these days. Down like that. I was like, oh, so you actually believe just like I believe. Or at least you practice the way I practice, right? Which is we, we hope and we ask for the power of God and the Spirit of God to help us. But you actually have it. And I've only heard, actually heard one person ever, and it was one of the speakers at their conferences who got up and said, if I, he said, I tell you, I am now walking in holiness. God has given me the grace that I am completely without sin. And I thought, liar. <laughs> Anyway, Paul was not a perfectionist. I'm positive of that, right? Because all throughout the Word of God, New Testament, we hear this idea of crucifying our sinful human nature or the flesh, right? And in order to understand it, to make it applicable, what it means is to die and to, to, to daily surrender to the Lord and say, God, not my will, but your will be done. 
In Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, lay down your life. If you want to follow me, if you're going to be one of my followers, lay down your life, take up your cross and follow me. Galatians 5, 25 says, we have crucified the flesh. Ephesians 4, 22 says, lay aside the old self. Colossians 3, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. Consider them as they're dead. Act like they're dead because they're not. That's the problem, right? And because... I know this is a doctrine that God is speaking to us today because the New Testament is, has consistent admonitions that we're not to go back. And if we were dead to our flesh, if there was no beast that we had to battle, we would not have the call to return. We wouldn't have the call of the wild trying to bring us back. Right? Ephesians 4.28 He who has been stealing must steal no longer. So now that you're in Christ, stop doing what you used to do. Once you were full of darkness, Ephesians 5, 8, but now you have light from the, from the Lord. Therefore, live as children of God. So in other words, now that God has done this great work of justifying you, now you, using your will, by the power of the Holy Spirit, walking in His grace, die to yourself and live for Him. Colossians 3, 7, you used to walk in these ways, and Paul listed those ways. Now you must rid yourself of all the, such things as these. So Paul describes this battle of the two natures, and I think that uh, it's important to, to note, to, to, to consider something, right? Uh, John Piper, the pastor from the Minneapolis area, he, he made a very, very interesting comment about this one time. He said, you know, Paul is not saying that he lives constantly with this battle and that he's losing it. Because I don't want us to get the wrong picture here. We, I think there's two extremes in this, right? One extreme is to, is to picture the Christian who is basically living like the devil, calling himself a Christian, and, and uh, still walking and failing and falling and saying, oh, it's the devil and me doing it. It's a sin in me. You know, I just can't get past this. And they're living in defeat, and they're living in bondage, and they're living in darkness. That's, that's the wrong application of this. Then there's these other guys, like I described, who think that they are perfectly great, and there's nothing wrong, and they're blind to their own need of death and dying inside of themselves. So Dr. Piper makes the point that Paul is simply making this, this case and making it clear that there is this battle inside of us. And as we go on through his, the Word of God, we'll see that we get the victory through the Spirit of God and through obedience to, to, to the Lord. But that we have this inner conflict going on. Robert Louis Stevenson, who is the writer of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, said, I thought it was sort of interesting, he said, I find there's always a struggle with a beast that lives within me. And he makes, made an interesting story out of that beast, right? And uh, Johnny Cash's son-in-law, Nick Lowe, who was not just his son-in-law, but a good friend of Johnny Cash and knew his struggle and his battle with addiction, one night wrote a song for, for John Cash, and uh, it became one of John Cash's uh, a real, a hit for him. But it also very powerfully shows the, the struggle that even a person who's in Christ can have with that beast constantly wanting to come back. He says, the beast in me is caged by frail and fragile bars. Restless by day and night, it rants and rages at the stars. God help the beast in me. And then I like the line in here, he says, sometimes it tries to kid me that it's just a teddy bear. And it will vanish in the air. And that's when it's, I must beware. The time when we think that we're doing just great and no problem and that the beast is completely gone. He said, God help the beast in me. And the problem, I think, with this beast is that it speaks to us, and it lies to us, and it calls to us. And it's always wanting to say, listen, follow me. You go ahead and, and, and invest in me. Do what I want. And the Spirit of God is contrary to that, saying, no, lay this down. Lay what you want down and live for God. I remember a story about two men lived in a small village and they got in a really difficult dispute that they couldn't solve and so they went to the to the town sage and the first man went and made his case to that man and the man said you know 
You're absolutely right, Lady Sphinx. You're absolutely right. The next night, the second man came to the sage and told his side of the story. And the sage shook his head. He said, you know what? You're absolutely right. And his wife said, after that guy left, his wife said, hey, what kind of sage are you? You can't do that. You can't be telling this guy he's absolutely right and that guy's absolutely right. Somebody isn't right. And he said, you know, you are absolutely right. <laughs> All right, one more about a beast. A good friend of mine, Tommy Lasorda. <laughs> who was evidently the former Los Angeles Dodgers manager. So I guess he was a basketball coach. <laughs> I actually had to look up, I had to, I had to ask, I, did I ask you, Stan, who this guy was? Yeah. I liked his story, I just had no clue who he was. But anyway, he's evidently a clever guy. He said that he had a battle with beasts inside him. He said one time, he said he took his cigarettes out and he held them in front of him and said, Who's stronger, you or me? He said, the answer was me. I threw the cigarettes aside and I quit smoking. He said, then one time, he said, I realized I was having a battle with another beast inside me. He said, I took a vodka martini and he held it up, held it up in front of me. I said, now, who's stronger, you or me? And he threw that thing away and he never touched it again. He said, then some time went by and he realized that he was needing to go on a diet. And he was sitting in the restaurant. He had a big plate of linguine with clams. And he looked down at that plate and he said, who's stronger, you I mean, the little clam looked up and said, Me! <laughs> he said, I lost. I just can't beat linguine and clam. So Paul, Paul has, has over the, the last few chapters, has talked about our need.